Oliver Wendell Holmes said, one's mind, once stretched by a new experience, can never go back to its old dimensions. In this podcast, we are proud to present our guests, the world leaders and pioneers in the fields of neurointerventional surgery, interventional radiology, and endovascular neurosurgery. We will bring you through their personal journey and the three cases that have marked their professional career. From the very first to the very last case, passing by the most enriching and challenging, Welcome to this original format by Link Online, my first, my last, my everything. Hi everyone, my name is Nantia Suji Chantararat and today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Raul Noguera. Dr. Noguera is a director of UPMC Stroke Institute, among many other titles that he holds. Dr. Noguera, how are you today? Very well, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. So let's start from the very beginning. So you're obviously one of the thought leaders and influencers of the field. That's why you're here today. But for those who may not know about you and the path that you took to get here, can you kind of walk us through that a little bit? So in terms of background, I'm originally from Brazil. That's where I attended medical school. I moved to U.S. in 1998, and then I pursued training, completed neurology residency in Boston then did fellowships in stroke and critical care neurology, then a little bit of diagnostic neuroradiology training, then neurointervention in Boston at the Mass General Hospital. That's where I start my career. Uh, I was there for about altogether between training and early career, about 11 to 12 years. Then after that, I moved to Atlanta to start a new stroke center at the Grady Memorial Hospital, they, they called Marcus Stroke and Neuroscience Center. And we started from scratch. We built the NeuroICU, the Neuroendovascular Service, and we were proud to actually have become one of the busiest thrombectomy centers in the country. Uh, we did a lot of clinical trials, and that was a lot of fun, but... Uh, then decide to move to Pittsburgh just last February to lead the UPMC Stroke Institute. A lot to unpack there, but let's just start with how would someone go and start a stroke center? What was that process like? So I think there are a lot of things that uh, sometimes converge in your life. I, I was actually very happy in Boston. I absolutely love working at MGH and at the Brigham Women's Hospital. It was an incredible experience, but I think for several reasons, I took that challenge. One of them is if you want to do clinical research, you need higher volumes. And of course, being at the stroke belt made a lot of sense. There was a great need back then for that type of a center in Atlanta. Most people weren't devoted uh, to really advance the clinical and research mission for acute ischemic stroke back then. And we decided to take the challenge and it was Really blessed to have a lot of support from the neurology department and my colleague who run the neurology department at Grady, Dr. Michael Franco. And over time, you build an incredible team. I think if you are passionate about something, right, you have to have a vision of what it can be before it's actually created. You have to be a little bit lucky because you have to aggregate people that are mind-like and share the same dream and the same passion. And you were fortunate enough to have that at Grady, uh, where I was again for about 11 to 12 years before moving to Pittsburgh more recently. So your name is on a lot of pivotal stroke trials. Earlier today, we had the opportunity to also interview Dr. Joven, who uh, is your colleague, and I know you guys worked a lot on these together. How did you guys get together and get to create all of these fundamental trials that we stand on today? When we started, there were very few of us. So interventional neurology wasn't a specialty even. We had maybe a handful of people doing it by the time that people like Tudor and I started. So it was relatively easy to meet each other and share experience and dream about what the future could be. And then it's just a matter of you know, putting out how those dreams into reality through work, right? And finding 
partnership help you developing it. We, we've been very fortunate to be able to collaborate with industry, right, to expand treatment indications for mechanical thrombectomy, finding new treatment modalities. And then more recently, even a lot of international collaborations with colleagues in South America and Asia. It, it is just one of those things that as we start doing it, new opportunities will appear and uh, you have to grab them and work hard to bring those next steps to fruition. And it's like one opportunity creates another, right? And as long as you keep dedicating yourself to make those things happen, they will keep coming. People like us, I, I'm personally someone who I'm more productive if I'm overwhelmed. If I don't have many things to do, I, I actually don't do as well. That comes with many other things, like there has to be a work-life balance, family balance. I'm blessed to have a very supportive family, my wife and two kids. They are very supportive of what I do. I come from a family where my father was a professor in my medical school and was actually one of my mentors. So I think in many ways, I was lucky to have had such a supportive environment and meet incredible people like Tudor, who I consider like one of my greatest friends. You mentioned briefly about working collaboratively with the industry in order to bring some of these trials. Obviously, our field is unique in a sense that a lot of the advancement and the tools that we have today really have a lot to do with what the industry is able to bring to the market, which is a collaborative work with what the field needs. Do you have any advice for trainees or young attending starting out their career in terms of how to navigate the relationship and how they can incorporate their relationship with industry into building their practice and how to do so ethically? That is a great question. I think the first thing is transparency. The second thing is, this is something that I personally learned on the go until late 2018. I actually worked for industry and I didn't accept any money from industry because I wanted to stay, let's say, clean, right? Have no financial bias. But the truth is you're always going to have some degree of bias. And I found myself in a situation where I spend a lot of my personal time, my family time, and I was starting to say no to good opportunities just because it wasn't necessarily fair with the family and I talked to people who were more senior than me and had done this very successfully and I thought ethically and there are several principles right so transparency is one of them the other one is diversity if you work with industry you either have to work with everyone right or you no one you really don't want to become someone who's linked to company X or Y, right? You need to be unbiased, otherwise you're not gonna be a good scientist. But there are challenges, definitely. There are challenges in terms of sometimes the perception, but when you look at cardiology, for instance, right? And you go to the New England Journal of Medicine, you see many of these practice changing trials. They were actually conducted by industry for academic partnerships, right? And the leadership, they had to have consulting time in birth for and now it's just part of the system. So I think it's okay to accept that. That took me time to understand, right? But transparency becomes very, very important and balance. I would say these are the two words when you are leading with industry, transparency and balance. Let's shift gear a little bit. We talked about the prior stroke trials that you've been involved in uh, and led, and those are obviously why we are here today at the point where it's a no-brainer that of course we're gonna go for anterior circulation, of course we can do so effectively, so on and so forth. Now, what do you see as a new frontier in stroke care? What do you see coming up in the future in terms of ischemic stroke? That is a wonderful question. So starting with a topic that we all kind of hope, if not new, but the ultimate proof was lacking. 
uh, strombectomy for basal artery occlusion. You had two inconclusive trials, the best trial done in China, which I was one of the PIs for, and it was really one of those heartbreaking events where we had 130 patients enrolled and we had at the end 10% treatment effect size, but you had to stop the trial due to too much crossover, like over 20% of control patients were going to thrombectomy. And at that point, you had to stop the trial that was no longer equipoise. Then shortly thereafter, we had the BASICS trial that's done out of Netherlands, Europe in general, and, and actually my home country, Brazil, as well, was another trial that failed to demonstrate the benefit of thrombectomy for basal artery occlusion, but was another trial that suffered from some selection bias, right? It took over eight years to just enroll 300 patients. Okay. I think the investigators had to change the inclusion criteria to actually include patients that had NIH stroke scale less than 10 when the own data from the basics registry like suggests those people would have much lower benefit. At the same time, they assumed that the treatment effect size would actually be bigger. So not surprisingly, the trial was inconclusive. There was a directional effect, but it was inconclusive with a treatment effect size around 6.5% or so. However, I like to say that BEST and BASICS, they paved the way for these other two subsequent trials, both out of China. One was called ATTENTION, which I helped design and coordinating which was a basal artery occlusion within the first 12 hours from time of estimated basal artery occlusion. And the second one was called Biochi, which Tudor Joving actually helped design and coordinating. And that one had a later time window of 6 to 24 hours. Both trials were overwhelming positively. And the reason why they were overwhelmingly positive is we followed the rules of a well-conducted randomized clinical trials, essentially by not allowing any treatment outside the clinical trial. So you, all what you had to do is say, let's say you need consecutive enrollment. If a center treats people out of the trial, you need to exclude that center. We also have to respect the target population, which is the people who have at least moderate to severe basal artery stroke, since we knew and, and basics confirmed that, that that patient population with NIH from zero to nine, probably if they benefit, they didn't have as much of a treatment effect size, right? It would be less, so you would have to have a bigger trial. So if just about 340 patients, which we were able to recruit in less than a year in these Chinese centers, we were able to show an overwhelming benefit of basal artery occlusion with a risk ratio of 2.1. And this actually speaks, and the same thing, the same type of benefit, there was even a benefit in terms of reduction in mortality, something that we haven't really seen in anterior circulation strokes. The only trial that have, has, has previously demonstrated a benefit in terms of mortality for thrombectomy was the ESCAPE trial. And that benefit was essentially derived from treating elderly patients, those patients that were older than 80s, because there was no survival benefit in the younger patients that uh, really derived from that cohort. So this is the, the, the first trial to show like a widespread benefit in mortality. Biochi didn't quite demonstrate it, but there was a numerical difference and a trend. And probably just because Biochi was a little smaller, you couldn't achieve a significance in terms of mortality there. But I, I think the importance of these trials is we can now go to the families, right, and say, we know that if we treat your family member, our expectation is that we're going to help. Yes, there are risks. Symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage is higher with treatment, was specifically 5.1% in attention. Thrombectomy arm versus 0% in the medical treatment arm. Is this dependent on the treatment modality at all? or? So we, we haven't looked that far yet, although in Biochi, one of the nuances about these trials, it's Asia, it's China. So about 40% of the patients actually underwent intracranial stent urangioplasty because there is a lot more intracranial atherosclerotic disease, as you all know. However, attention was large enough that you could look at the intracranial arterial population and also the non-intracranial arterial population. And the benefit is robust in both and was statistically significant even when you exclude the intracranial arterial population. 
The BIOCH group has done an initial analysis looking at patients who were stent versus not. Surprisingly, there was no difference in outcomes or symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. So stenting acute stroke may be safer than uh, we have assumed for a long time. And this is actually one of the frontiers that you're going to be discussing next is rescue stenting for persistent intracranial occlusion. But I think this is one of those things that we thought we knew but we didn't have convincing data. We had two inconclusive trials, and some people were using that as an excuse not to treat these patients, actually. So it's important that uh, we now have the ultimate proof to randomized clinical trials showing the same degree of overwhelming benefit. In fact, when you look at the common odds ratio in the ortho shift analysis, essentially, what are the chances of you moving at least to one point in your 90-day MRS score in favor of a bad outcome? The odds ratio there was 2.8 in the attention trial. And when you look at the patient level pool analysis in the anterior circulation, Herms for the early window and Aurora for the late window. The common odds ratio there is 2.5. So numerically a little better, but around the same range. So I think you can finally say that the benefit of basal artery occlusion thrombectomy is at least as good. And the safety is very favorable as well, despite an increase in intracranial hemorrhage, which we have not really seen as much in the anterior circulation, which was surprising to me. But in posterior circulation, it, it sounds like it may come at a cost. And I think this was something that has been very consistent in best basics attention by OG. You do pay a price, right? But I think now you can state that that price comes with a benefit very much like intravenous thrombolysis, right, for the treatment of stroke. And just to time mark this, we are doing this interview in the end of May 2022. So for those of you that may be listening a year from now or two years from now, where do you think we'll be by then? How long do you think it'll take before every one of us says, of course, basal or occlusion, NIHS says of, let's say, five, gotta go. I would say that at the European Stroke Organization Conference, the data was extremely well received. We have to acknowledge there are issues with the population being essentially a Chinese Asian population with all the particularities. Having said that, as I said, excluding the ICAD population, the benefit was maintained. There was no treatment effect modification by site of occlusion. And when you look at the comorbidities, Specifically, atrial fibrillation was around 20 25% range, which is very similar to what you saw in basics in the Western population. Same thing for diabetes. So I think the comorbidities are similar. The no ICAD population had a statistically significant benefit. So I think it's reasonable to say there is a good chance this is very well generalizable and it's not ethical to now perform another trial, it has been possible, right? Basics is the ultimate proof of that, right? That in the Western world, you couldn't do that. And in fact, best and basics reestablished the equipoise in China. We had this conversation and that's what triggered the idea, okay, let's do attention. Biocho was actually already ongoing. Attention actually came after two trials being negative and people, wow, Right, there was some equipoise that was reestablished, which was key for the success of the trial. I think the big question is how about basal artery occlusion with milder symptoms and I it's zero to nine? That I don't think you have an answer. And it would be a great target for a randomized clinical trial. I think uh, everyone has equipoise in that patient population based on the data. Basics suggest that maybe those people don't need treatment. But the problem is, when you look at a trial, you look at numbers. When you look at an individual patient, you can go down to the disability level. So an NIH stroke scale of six or eight, from a little ataxia, a facial droop, some sensory deficit, very mild weakness, is very different than an NIH of six or eight due to a hemiplegia. And that's the problem with these data sets. We are talking about numbers and we don't treat numbers. We treat individual patients and you actually know exactly what's happening to them. So this precision medicine, it's something that we need to start incorporating in our decision-making process. 
So I personally would not be okay not treating somebody with an IH of six or eight or nine just because it's less than 10 if they have a highly disabling deficit, right? But it's a fluctuating deficit, relatively mild. Then I, I really think we don't know what to do to these patients. Basal artery occlusion is relatively uncommon, right? It's about around 10% of all large vessel occlusion strokes. And then when you get a subset of milder disease, we probably have over-representation of intracranial atherosclerotic disease, by the way. So it, it gets really tricky. I'm not so sure it's going to be easy to study that patient population. We, we would love to make it at the target of attention to. We are looking at the attention registry. It's the largest basal artery registry ever performed with over 2,000 patients to see if you can get some signals of what to expect. But I think it would be a very challenging trial to conduct. My expectation is that based on two positive randomized clinical trials, we will have level 1A evidence to support basal thrombectomy. I think that may be some concerns again based on the fact that these, both of the populations came from China and we are talking about Western countries, but my hope would be that we all agree there is level 1 evidence, right? And we're going to conduct patient level pool analysis of the three trials, but again, three out of four we will come from Asia, basics being the only exception. And then we will know more at that patient level, pool analysis. But my expectation is that the treatment is going to be fully embraced now. Move on to other topics. There has been a tremendous interest in large volume infarcts or large core infarcts or low aspects score. I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that not our low aspects are large infarcts. There is actually a subset of patients typically with aspects four or five that because you know there is so much of the aspects that happen in that deep area of the brain that they can actually have relatively low volume infarct and have a low aspects. With the exception of the posterior limb of the internal capsule, which gets dual blood supply from the choroidal system and the lenticular striate system, those areas, they tend to be less eloquent than the more specifically the superior posterior cortical area. So I, I, I think we need to depart from the aspects, actually. We need to be a little more refined and think more about eloquence and size of lesion and quality of the lesion, right? Sometimes you have only cortical involvement with sparing of white matter versus like a pan necrosis. So same size of infarct, same quantity, but different quality. If you have sparing, if you have islands of cortex that are sparing or white matter that is spared. So this whole situation is very complex. And I think uh, after the Japanese study demonstrating that we can treat these patients and still provide a large significant benefit despite the presence of large infarcts. Granted, it was DWI, right? So you need, need to be careful because you, you see things on DWI a lot earlier than CT. So I'm really looking forward to see the CT studies confirming that. But those were large infarcts. The medium volume was around the mid-90s. And I think the results were spectacular, relatively small trial, but very important nonetheless. One surprising thing for me is I expected that the elderly people with large infarcts, they wouldn't benefit as much. And the median age in that trial was around 70 years old. And there was no treatment effect modification by age. That was, I thought, a fascinating finding. But I'll tell you, I think the direction you are going is that if you present in the early window with a severe deficit, the imaging becomes insignificant because if you are treating large strokes because they benefit, why do you need to know the size of the stroke? Why do you need to waste time with imaging? We know that in the first six hours or so, about 85% of the patients have favorable imaging. And the data now is pointing out, both from the HERMS meta-analysis, but now from the Japanese trial, that even the people with bad image, low aspects, large cores, they benefit from treatment. So why you want to know the core size? So I think one of the very exciting frontiers is actually the treatment of patients in the direct to angel approach. You bypass doing 
any conventional image with CT or MRI, we just do a little flat panel CT in the end of suite, exclude hemorrhage. You can do a flat panel CTA if you want to obviate an angiogram or just do an angiogram and then treat the lesion. And I like to say that we have the EKG of the brain, which is the NIH stroke scale equal greater than 10. It turns out that for NIH stroke scale equal greater than 10, yes, you may have an intracranial hemorrhage, yes, you may have a stroke mimic, but three quarters of the patient approximately will have a treatment occlusion. And when you look at an ST elevation MI on EKG, and you take those patients straight for PCI, for coronary intervention. About 20 to 25% of the patients don't have a treatable lesion. And cardiologists don't complain about it. That's what they do because they know time is muscle. But even more so, time is brain, right? The neurons are even more vulnerable to ischemia. You need to work even faster. So I think it's time for a paradigm shift. And I think the group from Walder Braun in Barcelona, led by Mark Rebo, they have done a spectacular work on this, uh, along with many other groups, including our group, Tudor's group, uh, Mario's group in Germany and now Switzerland, about taking patients straight to the angel suite bypassing imaging. We now have a single center trial called the Angel Cat Trial that was done again by Mark Rebo in Barcelona. And they demonstrate with a greater than two odds ratio that if you bypass imaging, you have lower disability at 90 days. And that it seems to be no safety concern. So on average, you're gonna save at least 30 minutes. So all those rapid progressors that are overrepresented in the ultra early window will have a greater benefit. So we are currently conducting a trial called We Trust that is actually funded by Philips. And there are sites in, in Europe, South America, and the United States about to start. They have enrolled some patients. Mark is the co-PI with me on that trial and, and again is doing a fantastic job with enrollment and all that. So, and there are other efforts out of France as well. So I'm very excited about this paradigm change. We may become just like cardiologists that we, within the first six hours or so, direct to angel, let's not waste time with imaging. Okay, as you have a later time window, then we need to select patients because many patients may have a complete stroke by then. But I think we need to capitalize on the importance of time and respect the importance of time early on the patient presentation. So many interesting things to unpack, but in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the last segment of the podcast. So we're gonna talk about the three cases that have marked your career. So for the first one is, what is the first case that you remember as an attending? I think whenever you ask that question, there are always cases that cause polarized emotions, right? They either made you very happy or very sad. I'm an optimistic, so I always try to, to think about the happy case. And this was when I trained, we still were using interterior rockinase for stroke treatment. And we were doing the multi-mercy trial during that time. And I was one of the early mercy adopters. And we actually had pretty good results with mercy. And I, I thought it was a device that deserved a better chance than what it got. And I really think if you had done a well-conducted randomized clinical trial with Mercy, things would have been different. The problem is, again, equipoise issues. You think that it works. I don't think MR Rescue was a Mercy trial. IMS3 was definitely not a Mercy trial. But in any case, we learn with our mistakes. And the case that I remember is treating a young female immediately after she delivered a baby. She came to us, transferred from another hospital with a full left MCA stroke and we treat her with the Mercy device and she was completely normal after the treatment. And I remember her sending a picture of her and the baby and that was, I think, one of the most rewarding experiences that, that I had early in my career. And it just made me like this passion about ischemic stroke and we gotta prove this works and treat more people and expand the window of indications, but also the global application. We, we are very focused on what happens in the first world countries and you forget about the 80% of the countries that actually don't have as quick and as good of an access to this technology. So we have to invest on that. And the resilient trial was something that was very special for me in that regard. I would say second and third, 
Second was in my first year as an attending, we had the first Onyx AVM cure in the New England area where I work, and I was very proud of that. It was like f my first few months as an attending. I had very good mentoring from my colleague, now DC, someone who trained me, Dr. Johnny Pryor. But to be able to do that so early in my career, and uh, actually back then that was my second passion. But then you have to ask about the third case. And the third case came about a year later and was someone who I treated for an AVM. And actually two days later, after he was doing great, on my birthday, he had a terrible bleed. And he didn't die, but he spent the rest of his life terribly disabled. So I think that uh, those are one of the things that you have always to, you know, you have to be humble. Uh, I'll never forget something that Dr. Vinuela told me very early in my career specific in relation to Onyx uh, AVM embolization, which was one of my passions early in my career, said how don't forget about the denominator. And I think that was a lesson. And it's just you have to be humble and you have to try to understand the complications and live with them. But you have to suffer with them. You can never accept a complication as something that just happens because that makes you better at what you do. Right? It makes you more thoughtful, more responsible about your decisions. And I'm grateful for that case because I think it made me a better physician. I feel for the patient. But I think it taught me how to be more humble, more thoughtful, to understand the consequences of harming with treatment. You don't always save, you can also harm. The last question before we end our interview today is, what do you hope to leave as the legacy in the field? passion to pursue your dreams. I like to say that I don't have the right of ever being sad in my life. Whenever I'm sad, I ask what my young self would think about me. And the truth is, and many of us, we are privileged people. I mean, most of us, if we're independently rich tomorrow, we would keep doing this, right? It's a privilege, it's fun, it's exciting. And I acknowledge happiness. Don't look at the half cup that it's full because that's one that matters the most. And I think that's the key word in life. Follow your passion and value happiness. Dr. Noguera, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Great to be here. <laughs>